Welcome to the Logistics of Logistics, a podcast dedicated to exploring how things get places and the people who get them there. We'll talk with logistics and supply chain leaders about innovation, industry trends, and the future of the logistics business. Now, here's your host, Joe Lynch. Hello, friends. Welcome to the Logistics of Logistics podcast. My name is Joe Lynch. Thanks so much for joining us today. Today's topic is a new model for grocery delivery with my friend, Sean Coakley. How's it going, Sean? Great, Joe. Thank you for having me on the show. Thank you so much for coming. So please introduce yourself and your company. Sure thing. So I'm Sean Coakley. I'm Chief Commercial Officer for Capstone Logistics. And if you're not familiar with Capstone, we're a national 3PL. We're focused on warehousing, distribution, freight management, and last mile delivery. And where were you guys based? And that never makes sense to ask about logistics companies, but I'll ask anyway. <laughs> well, so Capstone's headquartered out of the Atlanta area, but uh, me personally, I'm fortunate to live in the log- great logistics hub of Chattanooga, Tennessee. Oh my God. Does everyone have to live there or Austin? I swear to God. <laughs> hey, if if you've got the ability to live in, in somewhere like Chattanooga or Austin, I, I highly recommend you take advantage of it. I think my last three podcasts were with Chattanooga people. It is certainly a, a growing community here and, and has been a large logistics community in this city for a long time. I did a podcast with Sean Full, uh, Craig Fuller from Great Waves, and it was called The Silicon Valley of Trucking. That is Chad, why Chattanooga is the Silicon Valley of Trucking. Craig needs to broaden. We're beyond trucking. We're also warehousing and all logistics services. But yes, Craig Craig does an excellent <laughs> job promoting Chattanooga and all this, all the all that we have here from a logistics perspective. So tell us a little bit about you. Where did you grow up? Where did you go to school? Give us some career highlights before you joined Capstone. Yeah, absolutely. So I'm originally from Michigan. Michigander. I am a Michigander, just like you, Joe. I'm a I'm a proud Michigan State Spartan. The oh, you the just original, had a good year so far. <laughs> the original supply chain management uh, university. But to uh, date myself a little bit, I was there before it was actually formally a, a major. So I was uh, there in the mid '90s and came out with a with an economics degree, and you know, spent my first few years in industry working in consulting for EDS and Arthur Anderson, doing supply chain and trade management, working on some of the first trade management systems and transportation management systems that were being rolled out for supply chain management. I did a stint during the first dot-com bubble in a tech company out in San Francisco, and then eventually found my way into rider logistics on the automotive side there in Detroit ran automotive operations for several years and meandered my way onto the commercial side to where I eventually led commercial operations for a few of their industry verticals. So it, that, that was a fascinating experience. So, so when and why did you join Capstone? Yeah, so joined Capstone actually only about a year and a half ago because Capstone's a fast-growing organization that was really leveraging its base as a warehouse services provider and looking to build on additional transportation, last mile delivery, and other supply chain management capabilities. So it was a great opportunity for me to come in and and really shape that strategy and the commercial structure of the the company as we grow rapidly over the next five years. Yeah, before we get into the topic, you mentioned that you were at Michigan State before it had this world famous supply chain major. I've had this weird experience too. And, you know, I was an automotive, I, I, I w- went to school at night and I was an automotive designer and then I was a design engineer. And I remember then I kind of moved into program management, I did some consulting. Then I moved to the supply chain. So what was interesting is I remember having an interview probably in the 90s and somebody, the recruiter called and they kept saying to me, well, with your supply chain background, you'd be perfect for this. With your and they kept saying supply chain. You're being a supply chain professional like you, and I was like, I know what supply is, and I know what chain is, but I'm like, if we never if we had suppliers in automotive, we don't have a supply. Nobody ever used the term supply chain in the '90s in automotive. Absolutely. So I remember as soon as I hung up the phone with this recruiter, I called another friend who's a recruiter. I go, what the? Hell, it's yep. a supply chain. And he, and he goes, 
oh, you're you're a supply chain guy. I go, no, I work in engineering. I work in product development. I work in automotive. I don't work in supply chain. <laughs> yes. The, those of us who've been around for a little while, Joe, I guess, you know, back at Michigan State, while I was there, it was actually called MPNL, Material Planning and Logistics. Right. And by the way, there was a lot of people from who are like being their 50s and 60s, probably 40s, 50s and 60s uh, that I know who went to Michigan State who got degrees in purchasing there. So that was that purchasing degree. And they, they were always sought after, especially in automotive. Absolutely. So let's switch gears. Let's talk a little bit about a new model for grocery delivery, which we were considering calling this the revenge of the retailers, but, but we, we decided to go a little more bland, but I still like it. A new model for grocery delivery. So let's talk a little bit about grocery. Let's go back to the olden days, like five years ago. <laughs> you remember that? So the old, old way we used to go get groceries. We would, we had this delivery system where you would get in your car, you would drive to the store, you would pick up your stuff, put it in your basket, check out, and then drive it home. That was the delivery system. <laughs> what changed? <laughs> and it was a great model for the retailers, right? Because they outsourced, they were outsourcing the picking and delivery of their product to the consumer, right? So you came in, you picked your own product, you drove it home. And hey, in a single digit margin business, you know, that, that really, that's what had to happen. But as e-commerce has grown, as we all know, and, you know, despite the failures of the web vans of the world back in the early 2000s. Oh, my God. Yeah. Yeah. There was a company called Webvan that was a famous f flame out, right? It, yeah. And they really, they were way ahead of the game. They wanted to do deliver groceries, God, probably 20 Absolutely. years ago. Absolutely. The commercial model just really didn't work back then. And, you know, it, it's better today, but it's still evolving today, right? So, so what, what changed? What, why are we having this conversation? <laughs> well, like many things in this world, right? The infamous COVID. So we, you know, e-commerce, grocery e-commerce was, was steadily, perhaps slowly growing single digits of, of, of purchase <laughs> of uh, grocery purchases were via e-com pre-COVID. And then as we all started working from home and, you know, having concerns about going out and, and shopping in the store, there was obviously a rapid escalation in the, in the number of orders. And so today we're looking at potentially uh, the experts are predicting 20 percent of all grocery purchases will be made via e-commerce by 2025. And that's just an extraordinary number if you think of the the billions of dollars. Yeah. You know, and I think also when I think about home, de just food delivery, I know like I have kids who, who very, feel very comfortable, you know, say I'm just going to get food from that restaurant and they use DoorDash or whatever to get it. Uh, I guess I've done that a few times, but it, for me, I just like, oh, I'll just, I'd rather get out and go to the restaurant and even that during COVID perhaps. But it seems as if the younger generation, uh, younger people are just much more comfortable with the idea that, um, I'm going to go that I'm going to go get DoorDash as opposed to going to the restaurant. So I think we're seeing a generational shift there. But by the way, I think I, I've started using shipped sometimes to get groceries delivered to the house when I'm busy. And uh, other times I say, you know what, I'm just going to get out of the damn house. I work from home and I live at home. So <laughs> going, getting out of the house isn't the worst thing in the world, but boy, it just seems that that trickle that you know that this small trickle has turned kind of to a flood and you said it's going to get even it it has turned into a flood and what makes it even more complicated joe is is exactly as you said the demographics the solution to meet the different demographics can be unique it, you know whether you're an urban shopper or you're a suburban shopper or you're a rural shopper and you know, and are you expecting a rapid delivery, right? I'm making my spaghetti sauce right now and I'm missing a green pepper and I need it immediately versus I'm doing my weekly right. shopping list and I just want it delivered Sunday night, my entire right. week's worth of groceries Sunday night. Yeah. And so these grocery retailers, they did not have, they weren't really, there was this trickle and then COVID, it caused this flood, but they didn't have their solutions finished yet. They didn't say, oh, cool, our e-commerce, we'll just roll out our e-commerce solution. They didn't have one. Or some of them did, but a lot of the smaller ones would not. 
Exactly right. The big guys, the Walmarts of the world, the Targets of the world, obviously have been building their e-commerce networks for a few years now. But many of your regional or mid-sized grocery companies were just beginning this journey and they weren't necessarily ready when COVID hit in order to meet that demand. So they we all started using apps like Instacart, DoorDash, I use Shipped, and that seemed like the solution. So what's what's the problem with that solution for these? Yeah, guys? exactly right. So so many many of us turned to that model, and many of the retailers turned to partnering with those marketplaces in order to be able to execute an e-commerce solution. The the problem with that model is. The, the retailer begins to lose the relationship with the customer. So the bread and butter of a regional or a mid-sized grocery retailer is the, the selection and their knowledge of their customer base and their customer experience, right? So understanding that customer and understanding what product offerings they are looking for and how do they specifically market to that customer base. And if they lose that information and they lose that direct relationship, then it starts to erode their business model. So if, if these customers are all coming through a marketplace like Instacart or DoorDash, and that is their relationship with the retailer, then it limits, it limits their cut that customer experience. So, so that's where they're starting to wake up and realize there's got to be an alternative. Right. So the problem for these big retailers, and so who are the who are the largest grocery companies? I know Kroger's big, Walmart's big, Walmart, Kroger, Target's even got even Amazon groceries. Fresh. Obviously, Kroger's the single largest sole grocery retailer, but you also have Albertsons and Aldi and and Lidl and, and so Joe's, the list yeah. is long. You're right, and and we're fortunate at Capstone where we today serve over fifty percent of the U.S. grocery. Retailers, so obviously we have a lot of insight into, you know, where their challenges are and and where where the where the help they need is. Right. So when they all said we're going to sign up, we're going to start using these apps, and this will help us support people during COVID, and that was super important. I think it was great. It prob <laughs> I'd like to say it it probably lessened the spread of COVID, but it seems as if everybody got it anyway. <laughs> so, <laughs> but there was a loss of control. They no longer had control of the of the business. So now if Sean or Joe should use Shipped or Instacart, they own the experience with Sean or Joe. They own the relationship. And and you said they aren't even making good money on that. Speak to that. Right. So, you know, the, the commercial model with the marketplace is obviously different based upon the company and the, and the relationship. But, you know, they could be taking anywhere from 10 to 30 to even 40 percent commissions on any sale coming through the through the app. So needless to say, you, it's easy to see in a single digit margin business of grocery when you're turning over that much commission to a marketplace, the profitability of an e-commerce order is, is certainly in the red. So, you know, in addition to gaining more control over the customer, it also is becoming a how do I gain more control over the cost structure in order to deliver this solution, you know, in a more cost efficient manner. Yep. Sean, when we were prepping for this, I told you the story. When I bought some stuff, groceries through shipped, I don't know, about a few months ago, the gal came and delivered to the house. Very nice. Everything. She says, is everything okay? And I was like, I was like, oh, this is the wrong Diet Coke. And she goes, well, I picked the one you wanted. And I said, uh, and so it was caffeine-free Diet Coke. So I went back to Meyer. So Meyer, Meyer is by my house. I said, I'll just return it. So I went back over there and I said, hey, this gal bought this for shipped. I would like to return this caffeine free and get the caffeine full because I need it. <laughs> and, and the lady said, oh, well, when did you get these groceries? I said, yesterday. She said, what's your phone number? And by the way, that's my customer number at Meyer. Put that in and she goes, oh, I don't have a record of you shopping yesterday. And, and so ship does, but Meyer doesn't. I've been shopping at Meyer for 20 years. Right. And so they just lost that relationship. And another thing, every time I go on Shipped, it says, where would you like to shop? CVS, Target, Meyer. If I'm Meyer, I'm like, why are you giving Joe options to go away from us? We're his grocery store. We're his friend. <laughs> right? So exactly right. That's the, the epitome of losing the customer experience and the, and the customer relationship for that, that grocery retailer. Yep. And by the way, we were talking about this. I think you said they are 
some of these apps are talking about creating their own competition against the people they already serve. Am I right? Well, that's that's what the, a lot of the retailers are coming to realize is essentially by partnering with these marketplaces, they're also helping to fund a potential future competitor, right? So several of these companies have announced that they're opening micro fulfillment centers. They plan to hold their own inventory. Right. And similar to how Amazon eventually started selling their own private label product and promoting their own products, you should fully expect that those marketplaces will start promoting their own products and surprise, surprise, giving preference right. to, to their own sales versus to those of the other retailers. You know, you're a Michigander, so you remember that come this time of year, it starts getting cold up here. And more of I us don't miss be, it. Uh, right, right. <laughs> no, nobody does. <laughs> we love love Michigan, but it gets cold. And so people start using these apps. So I use Shipped. It would be real easy for me, or for them, I should say, to say, Joe, rather than buy at Meyer, we'll give you $50 off your first order at Shipped Fulfillment. And I'm like, oh, well, I'm going to give it a shot. Why not? 50 bucks off, right? It's that easy. And all of a sudden, an app, not, not to not to dis, discourage what they're doing. They've, they've created a great business. But if you're Meyer or Kroger, they're going to say, we have billions of dollars worth of buildings. We've been around for a hundred years. Right. And now somebody who has no physical location is taking Joe away, taking Sean away. It's got to be a shock to the system. It, it very much is, right? And, and listen, hey, these these market marketplace apps, they're incredibly skilled at promotion and advertising, and they know how to maintain that customer relationship, right? And even right. when retailers peel away from those apps and set up and establish their own networks, they're finding it difficult to pull that those consumers back away from that right. app to their into their own app. And and so it's it's one of these points of of how far down that path do you go with with the marketplace right. before you reach a point of they be they, you've completely lost touch with your customer. Right. You know, what, what I think we've seen in this, there's other analogs to this, is that we saw it at, at Amazon. Nike, we talked about this when we were prepping. Nike said, you know what? We want to own the experience. We want to own the customer relationship. We're no longer doing business with Amazon. I think same thing with Allbirds. There, I'm sure there's others. And the marketplace was fantastic, but it was it had limitations that we just talked about. I think also... For a long time, I had like these hotels.com app on my phone. But then I was at a Marriott and they said, you know, we'll give you a better price. And you notice on their commercials, Hilton, Marriott, watch their commercials. They make the point that your best deal is directly with us. It's not through hotels.com or any of these other travel apps, Expedia. And I think same thing. They're like, we're a billion dollar company. For God's sakes, can't we build our own app? <laughs> right. And pricing is certainly important, but it's also a service aspect, right? So by controlling that relationship uh, and, and building their own solution, their own delivery solution, a retailer can better control that whole experience, that delivery experience with the customer, right? So I'll give you a, a simple example. So today, if if you go in and you do an order, an e-com order, and you're asked whether you want to tip the driver or not, and that, that may show up on the receipt that the driver sees when they show up to pick up what orders, and this isn't a crowdsource model, but this crowdsource driver could show up and see what who has tipped and who hasn't tipped. And surprise, surprise, they choose the ones who tipped and not tipped. And if you didn't tip, that order may sit there on the shelf or, oh, yeah. or wherever the pickup location is for hours. So just that inconsistency in delivery experience is one of the activities that has to be overcome by building your own solution. Yeah. By the way, I always tip a lot on restaurants <laughs> and it shipped. But as a result, after people deliver it and then I get text messages back, hey, thank you so much. Could you make me your main personal shopper? Right. And 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 it, it occurred to me just what you said that on a cold winter day when no one wants to leave the house, <laughs> then they say, 
my uh, 3% tip did not get the attention of the personal shoppers that day. So I might want to up it to 20% or 30%, to get them, get them moving. <laughs> it's always a factor, right? That goes into, and it's a drawback of the crowdsource model, right? When you're using a pure crowdsource delivery model, you're always going to be at the mercy of whether it's lack of training of a driver, lack of branding. Process won't process will be different with each driver. It's, There's it's very much an inconsistent issues. process, which those of us in logistics hate, right? We love consistency. We love to optimize the process flow. And, and that's where bringing a third party logistics model into grocery delivery right. is really changing the game. Right. So let's switch gears. So we've talked, I'm, I'm, I'm going to summarize it real quick. So the old way in the olden days, five years ago, we just, we had this delivery model where we picked up our own groceries, brought them home with COVID and the kind of the growth of, we had the gro- growth of e-commerce, but it was a trickle. COVID causes it to be a flood. And at that point, none of these guys really, some, well, I shouldn't say some of them did not, some of the retailers didn't have a solution. So they, they turned to these third-party apps, which sounded like, oh my God, the savior until they, until they said, we lost the customer experience. We're uh, losing the customer relationship and Maybe worst of all, we're losing money. <laughs> what worst thing could happen to a retailer, right? Absolutely. Short of burning down, that's as bad as it gets, right? So, and maybe for funding a competitor at the same time, you're losing control, right? Correct. So you guys at Capstone, you came up with something new. Talk about what that looks like. Sure. So grocery delivery solution entails really two two primary activities. One is the technology and two is the operational execution, right? So first the technology side. So you have to have the technology that connects and seamlessly connects with the shopping cart and is able to take the order information, optimize the delivery routing, the order picking, allocate to drivers, as well as track, real-time tracking all the way up to the customer's door. So all of that information, right? It's it's all the capabilities of Uber with the basic capabilities in an order management system bolted into a retailer's shopping site. So you have to have that functionality. And, And at Capstone, we were lucky enough to acquire a company called Mile Zero a few years ago, which who Right. founders built that technology for Amazon. And uh, we now have applied it within our last mile business unit. So, so you have that functionality. So we bring that capability to the retailer and then we add into it the last mile delivery operation execution, right? So once the system determines who and where the, the uh, order should go, right? It's, it's essentially allocating it to a driver informing the driver where to go to pick it up or what to pick, right? And then tracking that person and that and training that driver on all the ad processes that need to occur in order for an effective delivery, right? So we put the management in place. It's not just a driver model, right? We have the management working with the stores, work training the drivers. We do full background checks on the drivers to we do the training with the drivers to ensure they understand our retailers process not just, you know, randomly drop the bags at the front door. And, and in right, addition right. to that, all that, we brand it. So we white label all our capabilities with the customer's branding. So when our driver shows up at the door, they're wearing the Cub Foods logo, they're wearing the brand colors, and nice. they're carrying the, the grocery retailer's bags. And they're there representing that retailer as opposed to, right, if, if watch for the e for the e-com marketplaces, I, I always laugh because watch their commercials and, and everybody in those commercials is branded in, in the marketplaces branding, right? And they're sh- right. whether they're showing up. And so what good is that to you as a retailer if all they're doing is promoting their own brand versus your brand? Yeah, exactly. And you know, one of the things, you know, when I was young, if somebody knocked on the door, you just run to the door and open it, right? At whoever it was. Now more and more people kind of check outside, like who's who would dare knock on my door without calling ahead of time. Right. Right. So I think in particular with older people, you need to have someone who has the appearance that work. I personally don't care about people's tattoos. I'm, it doesn't matter, but I can see some people saying, Oh my God, some guy with face tattoos 
maybe a rapper, is on my front porch. I'm not answering the door. So it is important that you get your brand kind of, and, and by the way, lots of nice people with tattoos. I'm not, not disparaging that at all. It's just you have to be careful about how we're get, making sure that that brand experience is brought to the house. Absolutely, right? And, and we work hand in hand with the retailer to say, you know, how do you want your brand to be represented, right? And and going back to your comment about just notifications of some random strangers showing up on your door, one of the great features of the technology is, de- again, depending on what how the retailer wants to set it up, we can set it so, you know, hey, I'm five minutes out, you, a text message gets pushed to the customer so they know that you're on their way. Hey, I'm in your driveway, right? And so the Right. The doorbell ring you're about to hear is from your cub delivery driver. Right. So that type of experience can be driven both through the technology as well as through process and training with the drivers. Right. So I want to step back for just a sec. So if I think about the retailer, they're going to create their own apps. This is not going to be a, a third party logistics company app. This is going to, you're not going to replace shipped with capstone right and you're saying no 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 you guys own your brand so you so they create their own app and i can download that just the same as i on my phone or do, use the in my laptop and so they own the the ship the experience where i'm picking out the food and then there's the uh you put it in your virtual cart and then it sells now are you fulfilling this through uh fulfillment centers or are you fulfilling it from grocery stores yeah, that, that's one nice aspects of our, our solution too, which is a little broader than your traditional grocery delivery provider, which is on a transportation side, we can handle both middle mile as well as last mile. So whether that's delivery from a distribution t- center to a store or a, or a micro food. fulfillment center to a store. So if you're, if all your e-commerce orders are dropping to a micro fulfillment center and then being sent to a store for curbside pickup, we can manage that process as well as the deli- actual delivery from the store to the home. And, and again, we can either, our model, we do not own our own micro fulfillment centers. We work with the customer to optimize their network to say, you know, what is the right solution for your network? And if that's pick in store, and fulfill from store, great, let's execute that model. If it's building micro-fulfillment centers within stores or standalone micro-fulfillment centers, depending on your capacity and your velocity, then who are those partners to go out and and build those types of centers? We put those in and then we help you execute from there. Right. So you mentioned you do the middle mile and you do the final mile. So let's talk a little bit about the grocery store miles here. So the first mile is from the CPG, the, the, the people who make the food or make the shampoo that you buy. So it's shipped from their location to a DC. That's the first mile. The second, the middle mile, which we call it, is the, the second leg of the relay is from distribution centers to stores. Sometimes it's the distribution centers to a micro fulfillment center Correct. or fulfillment center. And then the final mile is always either from the store or from the fulfillment center to the consumer. That's correct. So we have first, middle, and uh, final mile or last mile. And I think I uh, was having some conversations yesterday about this. Each one has its challenges, you know? So, so you have to, <laughs> you have to find a logistics company that truly gets each one because you could say, Hey, we've been doing, we've been doing grocery for 30 years. Well, if you're doing the first mile and you've never done the last mile, then you might have to, to make an acquisition or grow some, grow some internal capability. If you've always done the middle mile, super important. That's a very difficult one because you're delivering right. to a store and it's got to be on a tight schedule uh, or delivering to a fulfillment center, maybe less tight schedule. But when you're, delivering to homes. That's a unique service offering. So I think what we're finding is if somebody says I'm in grocery, the next question Absolutely. has to be and, and, first, middle, and really you need a partner who can mile. look across all of the modes, right? And help you optimize. Because listen, it's no secret. Grocery, grocery delivery is an expensive solution for retailers. And if you're only optimizing one portion of the network, the last mile or the middle mile or the first mile or the f- micro fulfillment versus right. fulfill in store. If you're looking at them as in f- from a discrete activity perspective, 
you may be optimizing one activity, but sub-optimizing the network, right? And so to truly drive down your total delivery cost, you need a partner who could come in and work with you to optimize from end to end. Right. So, so one other thing I'd like to just kind of clarify here, when you think about, I'm probably good at driving traffic to a website. I'm probably good at digital marketing. I'm good at all the, all the things that'll make that experience an online experience that is a good one and make people want to come back where I'm probably not strong is on fulfillment, right? As soon as they buy it is when it gets ugly. That's when you got to hand it off to logistics guys who say, yep, the pretty experience it's not going to be as pretty now. So we have to f- make sure that we really work hard to make that that experience from the time they buy it to the time they receive it positive. And that's that's the hard part. Retailers are in a uniquely difficult position, existing retailers like grocery stores, because they don't come from e-commerce. They come from traditional retailing. So they have to grow the capability to have a nice e-commerce solution. And I'm sure some of them have the money to create that nice e-commerce solution, but it is not going to be an overnight success because some of them are going to have to say, we have to kind of grow that whole organization or buy somebody or partner with somebody who's going to create that that online experience that is as nice as Ship, that is nice as Instacart. Absolutely. And that's a challenge. That's a challenge even before they get into the logistics piece. Absolutely. Before you get there, right, setting up your e-com department. And I would tell you, Joe, so most of the, you know, mid to large retailers in this country, grocery retailers, have established e-commerce organizations and, and have been over the last few years. But obviously, the growth of those departments, I'm sure, has exploded over the last two years, specifically. But also just purely the the understanding and the, the depth and scope of those departments, right? Because they went from just having responsibility for understanding the digital retail experience to suddenly now having responsibility for the retail experience and the actual execution of those deliveries. So, you know, we're starting to see within those e-com departments now supply chain people beginning to populate those roles where in the past right. they were primarily marketing and merchandising. Right. I think we're going to see some acquisitions here because I can see the big dogs saying, or even smaller companies saying, this doesn't make sense. We're going to really struggle to get the e-commerce experience to be, because let's face it, retailing is a very difficult business. Logistics and fulfillment, what we, took, what we do is very difficult. E-commerce is very difficult. They're all of a sudden saying, we have to figure out how to walk this very high wire, right? Yes. We got to do all of this right. And I think it's going to require some partnerships. By the way, when we were talking, prepping for this, we talked about Kroger and Bed Bath and Beyond have agreed to c- collaborate on some projects. So I think Kroger wants to add them to their marketplace, which is these Kroger stores that have more, um, they have florists, they have a Starbucks. Now they're going to sell more uh, Bed Bath and Beyond products, I guess, baby stuff. And it's going to be in store. And I think it's also going to be online. And somebody, some analyst I heard said, this might be the prelude to some sort of purchasing, some sort of M&A, because everybody's facing the same problem. Absolutely. And Kroger has very aggressive e-commerce, both grocery as well as general merchandise delivery expectations. So, you know, Kroger has has a well-publicized partnership with Ocado, where they're building... What is that? Ocado is a company from the UK specializing in the development of micro fulfillment center technologies. So they're partnering together to build these dedicated e-commerce fulfillment facilities, fully automated, that can do each pick based upon orders dropping from the website and then fulfilling directly out of these centers to uh, direct to consumers. So no volume through the through the stores at all, right? These are the hub of e-com fulfillment for the for the retailer. So I was going to say, how do you spell Okada, or is it uh, O C A D O? And it's it's 
it's an exciting opportunity. And, and Kroger, you know, one of the great things, if you look at Kroger's e-commerce delivery solution, though, is, is Kroger has recognition that there really isn't one solution to meet all needs, right? Because as we talked early on, right, the segmentation of whether you're in an urban location or a rural location and whether you're a small store trying to fulfill to a large population or a marketplace store trying to sell general merchandise in addition to groceries, you know, hey, a, a Costco sized package, right, of, of bottled water or of dog food doesn't fit into an automated fulfillment center very well, right? So, so there's custom solutions. And, and do you want to offer, you know, under one hour, under 15 minute delivery, or do you want it all to be slot scheduled slots future in the week? So there's a lot of characteristics that have to be taken into account when you're developing and, and designing these solutions. Right. And I think we all see subscription models out there also. One thing I could see is I could see a, a retailer a grocery store saying, Sean, Joe, we'll give you a big discount if you agree to receive a certain amount of stuff every week at the same time. Completely agree, right? You have the best economics for the retailer are a scheduled, what's called a slot delivery model, right? I'm on Sunday, I'm doing my, going through my grocery list. I'm, I'm on Kroger.com or CubFoods.com and I'm selecting my products and I say, I want it delivered Tuesday at one o'clock. I'm picking my slot or my right. scheduled delivery time. And, you know, I'm going to get my entire week's worth of groceries at that time. And, and that's a really efficient, that's a more efficient model and effective model. But there's a lot of venture capital money going into the rapid delivery model, right, where it's 15 minutes or less. And, you know, I'm going to deliver you that green pepper while you're making your spaghetti sauce uh, real time. Sean, you know, I mentioned this before on my podcast. So you're from Michigan. So when you were a kid, you had to shop at Kmart at some point and you hated it. Mom bought you a nice <laughs> Kmart shirt and you were trying to yank the tag off it. It sucked, right? But Remember what Kmart had? They had blue light specials. Right. So they would have these blue light specials where they, somebody would run through the store with this cart and there's this blue light and it was, hey, buy cheaper goods, even cheaper over here. And the problem with that was they, they advertised like crazy for blue light specials. So you get these circulars in the mail and everyone would be there for the blue light special. They had no control or uh, idea what their inventory was ever. Down south, Walmart was just the opposite. They had always low prices. They had consistent, they never had sales because sales are difficult in that it makes your, your inventory fluctuate. If I can get to a subscription model or a route model where I say I deliver to Sean's house every week, I've taken some, I've taken some risk. I've taken uncertainty out of my model. And another thing, I don't know that this is necessarily going to happen, but I could see where there's some number of, some amount of food spoils every week. If you can say, I know Sean and Joe and a thousand other people in this neighborhood will receive this food. I make the spoilage problem your problem. Right. <laughs> right. right. So, uh, so I think one other thing I want you to talk about is the, the whole idea of private label. That is super important to these companies. And all of a sudden, how do they make that work if people are buying without them? <laughs> exactly right, Joe. And it goes back to one of the early topics we talked about, which was having that customer data and, and, and full understanding of your customer base, right? If you lose that, that intelligence to an, an app, right, to a marketplace app, then you don't have full visibility to, you know, do my customers prefer scheduled deliveries or do they prefer, right, you know, next right. day or last day? Do they want, do they prefer branded solutions over my private label solutions, right? Where is the highest volume purchases during what times a day? All of that in business intelligence, right? It's the ubiquitous word and, and all logistics right. networks and supply chain networks today, right? But that intelligence is what really is going to be, is going to enable the grocery companies to get more productive and therefore, you know, lower their total cost of delivery. And right. if they don't have that data, right, it, it, they're a little bit, they're de they just continue to be at the mercy of the apps. Yeah. And so I think this is my feeling. I think we're going to see some grocery stores have a smaller footprint. 
And I think the stores that will, and not everyone, everyone, everyone will follow different models, but I can see some retailers saying, we're going to have a smaller retail footprint and we're going to have micro fulfillment, probably managed by third parties like Capstone. But I think every situation is going to be different. So I'm assuming that your solution is customized because some are going to say, I need this, this, and this. And others are going to say, I need something slightly different than that. It can't be the same solution. This is not the same as I get a different truck here every day and I don't care. This is, you're joined at the hip with your customers. Absolutely. And and that's why we say, right, it, it's all about how do we optimize the the network as opposed to just the same way if you went in and worked with a manufacturing company about how to optimize your transportation network. And you may say, hey, some portion of that network makes the most sense to go on a dedicated network. Some portion of that makes sense to go on a common carrier network. We can do multi-stop truckloads. We could do LTL deliveries. It's the same methodology looking at grocery delivery to go in and say, listen, for this chunk of your business, a dedicated model that drives your branded solution in a high level service makes the most sense. And by the way, we're talking about things you got to think beyond just groceries, right? We're talking pharmaceutical delivery as well as uh, alcohol. So when you're delivering alcohol or you're delivering somebody's prescriptions, right, you've got to be able to collect more information and you've got to have more right. training than is just required in, in a standard you know, delivering of your produce. So absolutely, you've got to be able to optimize the network and say this portion of it makes sense to be dedicated. This portion makes sense to still go to a crowdsource model from a cost perspective, right? So that 2 a.m. on a Saturday to a remote location doesn't make sense to have a dedicated driver. So what what is that optimal network look like and let us help you execute that solution? Yeah, boy, this is this has come so quickly. You know, this is one of those things that COVID was the inflection point. It really changed everything. You know, and I've said this before on my podcast, my mother use, uses her tablet. She's in her 80s, uses her tablet to buy from shipped. It's easy. And I can see at some point having prescriptions. I, I know it's miserable for older people here in the North, <laughs> the great white North. They don't want to, they don't want to leave their house on a cold days, right? On winter days where they think they could slip and fall. That that's we're all getting older. So I look at that is uh, and that that is going to be there's going to be a lot of changes happening. That ever stay tuned, stay tuned. Absolutely, folks. <laughs> it is the genie's not going back in the bottle. It's it's only going to evolve. And and what's exciting about it is is right now there's a lot of solutions in the market, and it's exciting to see how, where it will evolve. Right? Will rapid delivery become the expectation in the market, or will that be a very niche solution? Will scheduled deliveries or subscription models become more of the norm? Listen, what what I do know is is it's going to evolve, it's going to change, and therefore your solution needs to be flexible enough, right, to adapt to that change over the next few years. Right. You know, we're used to options, and I think you're you're, you're going to see a lot of different people doing business differently. And you know, in the past, even. A year ago, I would say, oh, this is an e-commerce company versus this is a traditional retailer. All those lines are blurred. And same with when we talk about what you buy at Meyer, what you buy at Costco, Kirkland brand or the Meyer brand or the Kroger brand, those private labels, that, that begs the question, are you a retailer or are you a CPG, right? So we are seeing more and more of these blurring of the lines. Well, I'll, I'll blur another line for you <laughs> real quick, Joe, which is, so the biggest of the retailers, so your Kroger's of the world, right, by partnering with Bed Bath & Beyond, and I'm sure there will be more to come, see their e-commerce website as being an advertising and search engine. And so they're, they're not just looking at it from a retail perspective. They're looking at establishing their own advertising and technology company for, for all intents and purposes, right? Because, hey, if you're Procter & Gamble or General Mills or 3M, and you're seeing, you know, actual buyers on the Kroger website, where else would you want to advertise than on the Kroger website for your product? And, and so the possibility to drive new avenues of revenue for a grocery retailer are exponential in this environment. Wow, <laughs> big, big changes. So I'm going to summarize this bad boy. So again, the topic is a new model for grocery delivery with my friend Sean Coakley on, on subtitle, 
Revenge of the Retailers. So in the olden days, we used to go get our own groceries. With COVID, and there's the slow trickle of e-commerce became a flood during COVID. And we all relied on these, the the grocery stores relied on this third-party apps. And they didn't realize that they were going to lose control, not only of the customer and the experience and the relationship and lose money. (laughs) This is a horrible deal for them. And still is because we all got used to it. And they're potentially funding a competitor. And by the way, I mean, nothing against those apps. I love Shipped. <laughs> I use it. And so what some retailers are saying, grocery stores are saying, we need to retake control of the situation. So they're partnering with companies like Capstone to do some micro fulfillment. And again, I think those each relationship is going to be slightly different, but it's basically taking the gig economy, which is just inherently inefficient, sometimes not as efficient as routes, not as efficient as logistics companies can be. They're not going to have the, the the technology nor the expertise to do what us, we can do. <laughs> so anyway, final thoughts on this, Sean. No, I, you're absolutely right, Joe. It, it's, it's applying the process and efficiency of lo- true logistics management to to what has traditionally or, or traditionally, I guess the last few the last years, five years right? yeah. <laughs> been a little bit of the wild west solution of grocery delivery, right? So so to driving efficiency, driving productivity and optimizing the network, all topics that are very familiar to logisticians, applying that discipline to that delivery solution in order to increase service levels and decrease costs. Yep. So before you go, who is the sweet spot for Capstone Logistics? Who do you guys serve? Yeah. So Capstone, we're fortunate to to have a pretty broad customer base. So as I said, we today we serve over half of the top fifty grocery retailers in this country, and we serve them both with our warehouse services uh, solutions as well as our uh, transportation solutions. We also are in, we, we do food distribution. We support food distribution companies, CPG cu- customers, as well as automotive and industrial partners. So really our, our unique aspect on the warehouse side is we don't own the assets in a warehouse. We like to say we're a guest in our customer's house. So a lot of our large, we work mostly with Fortune 500 co- companies. We come in and we operate their warehouses. So they own the real estate. We own efficient management of those buildings, and it can be everything from unloading of the trucks to the entire building itself. And through our pay for productivity model, so we're big believers in performance based commercial models, we're able to drive productivity levels that few others in the industry are, are able to achieve. So that became was originally the core of Capstone and has grown over the years as, as we work with those retailers to identify their needs and their challenges, added on last mile delivery to help them bo- do both the middle mile as well as that final mile, as well as freight brokerage and transportation management, helping them get capacity to our carrier base so that they can execute their sh- uh, shipments more efficiently. Very nice. Very nice. Well, you guys have, you have a white paper on this topic, right? Uh, Absolutely. We've got a case study out there with specifically with Cub Foods, who's just recently rolled out their new solution. So what I'll do is I'll put a link to your LinkedIn profile, a link to that white paper and a link to Capstone's. Any, Any place you want me to link on Capstone, just send me those links and I'll put them in the show notes. And appreciate you taking the time. This is a fantastic topic. I mean, it, boy, it is so broad. <laughs> yeah, it is. And, and it's, it, as I said, it's an evolving market oh, today yeah. and, and has only escalated due to COVID. So it, it's an exciting time in the industry. John, I sometimes think that I want my podcast to dissolve over like three years, four years, because if you were to listen in five years, go, oh my God, listen to these two old idiots talking about the grocery model. You're exactly <laughs> right. So I, I, I want to go on record right now at the end of this saying, hey, just because I believe this in 2021, come talk to me again in 2023, because it will, I'll guarantee you, it will be a different solution and, and a, a different model, but uh, we'll be there to execute it. Yeah, I think I'm excited about this because I think this is going to be a better model. I, You know, s- sometimes when you 
this has been a very low margin, difficult business for a long time. And I love the idea that nobody wants nobody wants to be thrown into the deep end like this. Uh, but it, it, good things happen when it, we've we've experienced this in the past in other industries. Is that shock sometimes leads to really good results? Absolutely. So it's it's an inflection point, and generally from from inflection points comes creative, innovative solutions. And and you know I fully. Ex- Fully expect that we'll be leading in that area, but there'll be several other that'll that'll hit the market here that we'll all be adapting to. Yep, yep. Thank you so much, Sean. Thank you, Joe. And thank all of you for listening to my podcast. Your support is very much appreciated. Until next time, onward and upward. You've been listening to the Logistics of Logistics podcast, where we engage in conversation with experts in the logistics field. For more details, visit thelogisticsoflogistics.com or follow Joe Lynch on LinkedIn.